pups. It's been a long, winding road. And now that the gears are turning, I think about how it all began. And as a matter of fact, it all began with these eyes. The Bedouin hostess he portrayed back in 1972, near Baalbek. Her look is hypnotic, immersive, deep. In some way it reminded me of the first word I learned in Arabic, Ahlo Sahla, which would translate to Welcome. When we were kids, our grandmother would sing this word to my brother and I every time we visited. What brought me now to Lebanon was to try and understand its past and what drew you to portray it. But to answer that, I guess we have to start from the beginning. Where were we? We were, oh, in, in art, which is the subject of our yes. really being in Beirut at the end of the day. Whether it's for you now discovering it, or for me living through it, <laughs> there is nothing to... But that's Beirut. It's pulses, it revives, it's fantastic. It's all chaotic. It's everything you hate in a city and everything you can't live without. Before the war, it is the country where I lived since I was eight years old. It is a place where you grew up with children of your age, multi-factional, multi-religious, multi-whatever it is and you never, never, never thought at any one moment of the differences that made you coexist, rather than that living together in this variety was the natural thing. And as we grew older in reality, we thought, I think at least, that this richness of diversity that is in the Orient uh, is the richness of civilization. And it coexisted well together all the time. This is the Lebanon that I was parachuted into as a child. And it stayed with me until I left. Uh, I had my first camera like uh, all fathers. My father, at the age of 11 or something, 12, gave me one of these soapbox cameras. And I took a couple of pictures, as usual, it's family, and that was my grandmother. Now, looking at the print of it now, I'm surprised. But I, I did good photographs for the family. So on my second degree, which is three years after, he gave me a Kodak bellows. And at that same time, I started photographing more. Then by the time, by 1969, I was, till 1969, I was doing it on the side of the many things I did at the time, until I was asked to do the poster and the catalog for Jaita uh, second concert by Karl Heinz Stockhausen. And I knew that they are also inviting Max Ernst and the group Andre Masson and or friends of Stockhausen to the and I decided it's about time that I had my own camera because I wanted to do a, a portfolio on Max Ernst, who was for me one of the idols of the of 20th century painting. And I bought a camera, a Nikon F2S or 
something like that. And I did my first serious portfolio on Max Ayers. And then, you know, photography is a bit like a smoking or a drink or a drug or it, it, you can't leave it. Then it's stuck all the time here. Now I, I, I take it a bit easy. But that was it. I enjoyed snapping moments. I didn't see all my, my what I photographed because I did a lot and I was busy doing something else. But an archive accumulated. <laughs> so that's what's with photography. It's, uh, it's not a profession. I've never, till very recently, sold a photograph. But I enjoyed and to ecstasy shooting rare moments. your memories through the entire archive, we came across a personal memory of mine. My brother Tarek and I in front of the ruins next to the Palmyra Hotel in Baalbek when we were just kids. A second memory appeared. Me resting at the Haider family house. My trip was leading me there and it was time to go back to that town, to that house. specific house is like the emotional womb for us when we came to Baalbek, we came to to feed where we could have been eternal, you know, it's very strange. You have encountered, let's say, uh, the owners of the house, you have encountered them. Now, we don't see each other. There were periods we didn't see each other for more than 10 years. But when you step in here, you are in your, your private world. It's very strange. And I knew, and that's always the feeling. It's your private world, your private paradisiac place. This is, I knew this place, I knew the father, I knew the mother, I knew the sisters, I knew, I knew every, I knew their children, I knew, uh, it's, it's a place that you, you know, it's like my family. I know them more than my family in Syria and Iraq. بعلبك اللي بيك بيعرفها مثل ما نحن بنعرفها أه انا بقول 
مثل ما الروح الانسان تشكر بجسد زمان بيشكر بمكان بس يفل الزمان بياخد المكان معه بهداك الزمان يعني بهداك المكان ايضا بعلبك كان النهر كان بالميرا كل المسرح بالعالم كل الموسيقى بالعالم كل ال 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 التياتر الباليه الاوركستر سيمفونيك فون كوريا بعلبك وين بدهم يروحوا هودي اللي اجوا طلعوا على ظهر الشير مثل بيجار يطلع باخر الليله يشوف الشمس كيف تطلع كيف الضوء بيطلع آآ آآ هاو ما ما بفلوا وبتفل معهم بعلبك اللي بقت بعيونهم لا هيدي بعلبك بعدها بتناديهم وين ما رحتوا بتضلكم فيني انا بعلبك مثل ما بيقول لمارتين اوبجي اناني مي افي فيو دونك انام كي ستاش انو ترام ما تفكر الحجر ما بحس ما تفكر انه سجر طريق راس العين بينسى وضح فارس واصحابه والناس اللي كانوا يجوا باخر الليل اللي يسهروا فيه السجر بيتذكر اذا الناس تغير After finding out what Baalbek meant to you and to the Lebanese, it was time to leave paradise and go back to Beirut. From harmony, back to chaos. A chaos that always brings you back here. A chaos that I remember since I first saw our grandmother's blinded metal door and had my first connection with the recent history of war in Lebanon. Back here, I come across the picture with which all this began. Now, I don't focus as much on her look, but on how that picture was taken. I see the connection between that picture and one of me at Al Rauda Cafe. I saw clearly the eye that took both those pictures, and I began to see all those photographs in a whole new way. Beirut. Every time I come, I see the same buildings with the same scars since I came as a kid after the war. But I also see the Lebanese's power of will. They keep an eye on the past, but always look forward. They survive. And there's a survivor I know that I needed to talk to, Saleh Barakat, a good friend of the family that once told me, your dad's pictures are a national treasure and the world has to see them. And I always ask myself how you two came to know each other. When I started uh, considering uh, opening a project of an art gallery back in 1989, I made a tour of uh, the, the people who were the, the most knowledgeable about the art scene. So I met most of the artists of the period, most of the art critics, most of the galleries. And of course, Wadah Faris remains one of the top actors in this field. He was a, probably the top gallerist before the war in Beirut, and he moved, continued his project in Paris, making uh, 11 fiac in a row, and of course, always defending uh, art of this region. So for me, it was extremely important uh, to meet this uh, uh, person that everybody liked and everybody talked about. And I made the effort to, to meet him and I met him. And it he was extremely important in my career. And of course, the relationship kept on growing. And when he started coming back more often to Beirut, it was like the mentor that uh, anyone dreams of. For me, he is somebody who is a witness of that time, a witness of that history, a very generous person uh, to share uh, everything he mm, accumulated through the years, a great mentor that somebody like me really, uh, I'm very grateful to him. And at the same time, we agreed that one day uh, I would like to do an exhibition about this these golden days of Beirut as seen through the eyes of a major witness who lived it, uh, namely Waddah Faris. Let's hit the road. 
little pups. Okay. I'm wondering, pups, uh, pups, how did you start thinking about recovering the your photographs? In reality, you know, I moved them always with me. The last time I was in Barcelona some time ago, in a year or two ago, when I was there, I brought almost everything else. I don't know, I must be looking in Jafra to see if there are, there are still some others because the idea came that I wanted them near me because I was spending much time perhaps here. And the idea started with, you know, writing the book. The, your mom keeps on badgering me about, you should write, you should write. <laughs> well, it started by collecting, you working your biography around what you did what you saw, what you liked, what you registered. And seeing the photographs helped me in a lot in recuperating the sequence. Sure. And luckily I keep all my passports, all this uh, move, life of movement. And uh, the passports allowed me to you know, almost pinpoint where I was, when, at what time, during the so, past 30 years. Because I have all these passports. I have a pack of them. Let's see when we manage to make our exhibition, eh, Papi? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that will, will come. But you have to take your... Yani, your photography work a bit seriously, perhaps. In the sense of developing it, seeing it, etc. And uh, studying it, criticizing yourself for what you want to do. And when the idea of doing the film, Papi, came out about showing your pictures and so, what did you, how did you feel about it? I was happy, but I was not, uh, perhaps, you know, you know me. I didn't want, you know, uh, when you write one book, I didn't want to write it about myself. It was more a kind of witness to what I went through, people I knew, all this sort of thing, to commemorate their lives as well as recall my life, but I don't do things in a self-centered way. That, when you did it only on that, okay, I liked it for you. You liked the project, it triggered your uh, imagination, but uh, secretly I thought it was too much, uh, you know, but then when the idea was expanded to now, uh, that made it more balanced and worthwhile for me. I, I like it. Now that the images come to life, all their memories come with them. You used to talk to me about your life in the world of theater and an actress and close friend of yours called Nida Lashar. I felt like I needed to go see her and learn her thoughts about what makes Lebanon what it is today. I want to say something very cruel, but I have to say it. We will never stand on our feet again, ever. It's a mess. The only people that are different are the artists that still believe. And you know, I think we believe 
not in change, we cannot change anything. We cannot make a revolution. But we can stay in the hearts and souls of people for many years in their heart. It will not change anything. Maybe it will make them, I don't know, I don't know. But the people that give the spirit and the soul to the, this country are the artists, the writers, the painters, the people that believe in this, in this country which we do not have anymore and we will not have anymore, but we continue to work. This is it, this is Lebanon. is almost ready. All the pictures are getting hanged. All the images of the designs you did for Baalbek or for your galleries. Everything is put on display for the people to see, to enjoy, as we did since we were kids. We've always been privileged to see these pictures but we never really valued them for what they were. A document of history, of a country that always remains in the shadows. And it shouldn't. Now that the opening is almost here, it's time to sit back and enjoy. people are so uh, uh, survivors that with one good news, everything will be fine. Before I die, I would like to see my country rebuild it and uh, respect it, respect it as a country, as a land. We have a beautiful land. I want it to be respected. Now that your pictures have finally seen the light, I can't stop thinking about when I was around 15 years old and you gave me my first photography camera. One of yours, your Leica R8. And you taught me how to use it. There's another lesson that you taught me. In some way it has to do with photography. But I believe that it has to do with much more.
You told me, while you're looking through a camera, doesn't matter if the person in front of you is three months old or 80 years old. There's one thing that never changes.